So welcome everybody today to one of our monthly sessions for NHSR Community where I've got Chris Beely talking about um, licenses and copyright and all things to do with the sharing of information that we have. Not data often, but usually code. So I'll pass this over to Chris. You'll be more eloquent in the discussions around what we're going to do today. Great, yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Chris Beely. Um, I'm Head of Data Science uh, at the Strategy Unit. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about open source and copyright and other such interesting things. Uh, I'm just going to put my slides on the screen. I'm afraid my slides are on a different screen than my camera, so I'll be looking away from you at all times, but so apologies for that. Um, right, am I all good with the slides? Yes, showing nicely. Thank you. Excellent. Right. I shall kick off then. Uh, just I'm going to do a quick disclaimer. I did do this talk somewhere else uh, a little while ago. Um, and oh, I'll tell you what I should do, actually. Let's put the. Um, uh, or maybe uh, should I do it later? I don't know. I, I could have put the link to the slides in the chat. I wish I'm wishing I'd thought of doing that earlier, really. Just let's just have a bit of an awkward pause while I do that. Um, so. Here they are. Where is the Zoom chat? You know what? I don't know where the Zoom chat is. I'm going to slack Zoe because she knows where the Zoom chat is. That's what I I'm going to do. Yes. That will be quicker than rather than watching me faff around for ages. There they are. Anyway, so I did do them recently somewhere else, which is why they got 20 days on. That's what reminded me about sharing them. And it was like an internal meeting. So I probably said things that I wouldn't say now. So I'm just going to have to just, if I slow down occasionally, uh, that's me just thinking, is it okay to say this? because uh, it will, of course, be on YouTube. Um, right. Okay, so I'll kick off. So the first thing I want to talk about is a disclaimer. So I'm going to be discussing someone who's been very influential in the world of open source for a very long time uh, by the name of Richard Stallman. Now, Richard Stallman has said lots of controversial things. Uh, he said controversial things about open source, but he's also said some very controversial things about things that have nothing to do with open source. Uh, you can't really discuss open source without discussing him, but I just wanted to mention... Some of you will be familiar with this, I would think, so we won't. I just want to just be clear that uh, none of this is particularly supposed to endorse him as a as a figure or a character or, or any of his views, um, but he's part of the history, so I'm going to talk about it. So um, that's the disclaimer out of the way. Right, so um, I think it's really useful to kind of like to dig in a bit, really, because I think a lot of data scientists like me talk about um, you know, we want things to be open source and we sort of get what it is and we want to do it and it's very popular. Um, but it's, I think, just useful just to kind of get a bit of a flavor of where it's come from and some of the detail of it. Um, I've spent a decent chunk of time kind of reading about it on and off over the years. Um, so this is going to be a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a deep dive uh, into the world of open source. Some of it probably won't be super amazingly relevant to data scientists per se. Uh, but I think it's it's interesting for, for historical purposes, uh, and I think some of it will help you to kind of uh, be a better scientist and share your code better. So um, open source actually is is actually how we started. Funnily enough, I think that's an interesting thing. I often say that to people outside the tech world who don't really get open source is that when kind of computers started to become really important, um, all software was open source. And the real reason why software was open source was because Nobody made any money selling software. They made money selling computers. Um, and actually, uh, often the computers were a little bit different and the software would be a little bit different. And obviously the people who were buying this, I'm talking about the 1950s and the 1960s, they were, you know, like leading departments in universities and they were operating mainframe. You know, they were expected to be IT professionals. They weren't selling it to your average Joe on the street. So it was very natural to say, oh, we've got a different computer model in here it is, but you'll just have to modify the source code slightly to, to make it run. And that's just that's just how things work. Over time, that relationship changed. So of course we've witnessed throughout the course of, uh, certainly my life of all lives since computers were invented, the, the price of hardware has fallen considerably. Computers have got much, much, much faster and much, 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 much cheaper and much smaller as well. Um, and the cost of producing software went up at the same time. So people were making less and less money producing hardware and they were making more and more money producing software. And as those lines kind of crossed each other, we got the world of uh, proprietary software people. People kind of got the idea 
that, well, nobody's really bothered about buying my computers, but why don't I write a beautiful piece of software and sell that? And if you want to sell software, uh, usually you need to make sure that nobody else can use it. So code bases started being closed up and people started selling code to each other. So that's the background. So the, the legendary story of one of the kind of real, real kind of key moments in the history of open source is all to do with Richard Stallman's printer. The chap I did the, um, the, uh, the disclaimer about a moment ago. So Richard Stallman used to work at MIT. Uh, well, for I, he still does, who knows, I don't know, no idea where he is, but um, he did uh, in, in 1980. And they took delivery of a new printer. Um, and he found that he wasn't able to modify the source code of the printer. So the previous printer uh, would jam, as printers do. Um, and that would be very annoying because the whole building would be sending print jobs to it and they'd all be clicking to print, 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 print. And then you go to the printer and you find it's full of print jobs. It's got 25 print jobs. None of them are run because it's jammed. And then you've all got to stand around in the big queue waiting for your printing. So what they did is they modified the source code of the printer. And every time it jammed, it would send an email to everybody in the print queue saying, help, I'm jammed. And then somebody in the print queue who obviously had a stake in this issue would come to the printer, unjam it, and then everybody else would get their printing in a timely manner. Uh, but this new printer didn't do that. So he uh, contacted uh, someone who worked on the printer uh, software, who I believe he was like a sort of uh, associate of his, a colleague, a peer, someone he knew, and said, can I please have the source code for the printer, expecting them to say, yes, here it is. And they didn't. They said, no, I'm sorry, I can't give you the, the source code for the printer, it's proprietary. Richard Stallman was absolutely furious. He was, you know, uh, the idea that you could buy something and then not be able to modify the source code. It was, you know, completely ridiculous and abhorrent to him. Um, and he went away and did lots of thinking about that uh, and ended up launching the, the GNU project uh, in 1983, uh, basically to, to kind of fight for this principle, for the principle of you own a thing, you can modify the source code on the thing. And I'm not going to say all this on YouTube. I did say a bit more in the internal meeting. There are lots of companies that I could name that don't agree with this principle and are very happy to sell you gizmos and widgets and all sorts of other things that you can't modify the source code for. Um, opinion varies on how important that is. But to Richard Stallman, it's a very fundamental aspect of kind of software freedom that you are able to do your own thing. If you've got a printer and it doesn't work the way you want it to, you should be able to, to, to change the way that the printer works. Um, some other notable kind of uh, things in the, in the history of open source, the MIT license, which la launched in the late 1980s. I'll be talking about the MIT license later on. It's what's called a permissive license, which is sort of a do what the heck you like kind of a license, which I'll describe in more detail later on. Another influential moment in the history of open source was the release of a, of a well, it, I think it's basically started as a kind of blog or a kind of a long essay, uh, but uh, it's a printed book now. Uh, I recommend uh, it's a good read called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And The Cathedral and the Bazaar is all about um, open source and the kind of why open source is a good idea. Right, so what is open source? I'm finally addressing that fundamental question after talking for 10 minutes. Um, so Richard Stallman again says uh, that you should think of free as in free speech, not as in free beer. So the, the dual meaning of the word free in the English language has caused a lot of confusion over the years in the world of open source. Open source has got nothing really to do with the concept of being free of charge um, and everything to do with the concept of being free to, to do what you want, to, have, to be free to behave in a certain way, whether it's modifying the source code of your printer or some other software freedoms that we'll talk about later on. Um, so it's really crucial, basically, this point is um, open source does not mean free of charge. So, so one of the fundamental software freedoms is you can charge for software if you want to. Um, that's been more and less useful over time. You know, um, back in the day when I was a, when I was younger, uh, uh, people would stick Linux on a CDR and post it out to you. Um, and they would charge for that service because, you know, why wouldn't they? Um, and it's really important. It was really useful that they had the ability to charge for the source code because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to charge to post it to you. And then you'd have to download it with a modem. It would have taken you know eight days and run up your phone bill. Um, and all, equally free of charge does not mean open source. So there's loads and loads and loads of software. I mean, it's, it's all around us these days. Um, it's totally free to use or to download, but it's not, it's not in any way open source. So for example, Zoom, um, which we're on right now, in fact, um, 
people got very interested in the source code of Zoom recently. So sort of t- I picked a topical example because Zoom had a thing about training AI on some of the data that was put into Zoom. And suddenly people wanted either to look at the source code to see what they were up to or also to, to look at the source code so they could just make their own. And of course, Zoom, you know, their, their business model clearly is to not allow you to do that. So there's a diagram on the screen. Now it's deliberately confusing before you all sit there and think, wow, what a terrible diagram. This, this presentation is awful. I'm going to hang up and go do something useful. It's deliberately uh, confusing um, because there are loads of different types of free software and there are loads of different types of proprietary software. As you can see, they've all got all, I'm not going to go into all the whys and wherefores of it. And I'm, I'm going to say something now, which I'm going to say several more times. I don't talk, claim to understand all this stuff. Uh, I am not a lawyer. That's the argument that you often see trotted out on Stack Overflow. People say that I am not a lawyer um, and I am not a lawyer. That's very true. Um, but I do kind of want to slightly argue against that is I feel like sometimes when I'm talking to people, they say I am not a lawyer and they feel like, they, oh, well, so I can't do anything. It sort of almost seems to shut things down. Um, I'm not suggesting that you do anything weird or risky, like try to make your own version of Excel and sell it out of your garage. Or, you know, clearly you're going to want legal representation at some point. But I think your average typical data scientist could learn enough from doing a bit of reading to feel confident they're using the right license in the right circumstances in the right way. And this constant kind of, you know, fear of not having a lawyer involved is, I think, overblown. Um, I will say also that I have spoken to lawyers, to be fair, not software lawyers, but I've spoken to lawyers who don't understand it either. So, you know, I think that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, Anyway, so it's confusing. It's a confusing world. I'll be saying that again. Right, so the four software freedoms. So these are uh, something that Richard Stallman came up with as part of his free uh, software movement. Um, the freedom zero, now I thought for a long time this was a computing joke because uh, most programming languages, not R, but most programming languages start from zero. That's what, what's called zero index, so Python, for example. Uh, but I've since read it's not a silly computer joke at all. It's just because they had freedom one, two, three, and then they thought of a more fundamental one and they didn't want to kind of, re- they didn't want to change what freedom two was because that's confusing like changing the second amendment of the constitution. It'd be weird if they all moved down one, so they went to zero. So I don't I, I don't know which of those is true, but I thought it was interesting. Um, that there's these weird rumors about them. Um, right, so freedom zero, and I'll be picking up on a couple of these as being more important uh, later on, but um, just to go and kind of go through the art. So freedom zero is the freedom to use the program for any purpose. Um, and I think this is a really important one. I think some of this talk is, I'm not really telling you, I'm just, advising you how to talk to people who are not data scientists, how to talk to non-tech, because I've spent a decent chunk of time talking to that kind of people who don't understand this kind of stuff. So Freedom Zero is really important because people will do annoying, stupid things with open source software. And I think there's this idea that people, it's quite naturally that you would have some influence over that process. And it's just really important to be very clear with people early on and say, no, no, if we release this open source, people will do anything they like. And I'll, I'll come back to that one. Freedom one is the freedom to study how the program works and change it to make it do what you wish. This is the Stallman's printer freedom, basically. Um, freedom two is the thing I mentioned about the Linux CDs, basically, the, the freedom to to, um, to make copies of software and to distribute it. Uh, and obviously, that's that's kind of the really key parts of this. And of course, you know, the explosion of the internet and so on has made that so, so easy so you can distribute software at a mass level uh for a very 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 low price in this day and age um and freedom three that's hard to say freedom three uh is the freedom to improve the program and to release your improvements so if you take um a piece of software um that does something you like and then you add something back uh you should be able to say to people hey look at this thing look i've I've made it better look you can use this new better version and the person who originally wrote it might also think oh well that's better i'm going to start using that too now, GitHub enshrines that freedom in a, in a workflow, as many of you will be familiar with, but the sort of the freedom that it entails basically is the idea that you can take something, improve it, and give it back. And that's, that's really fundamental to the whole process. Right, so I mentioned Cathedral and the Bazaar uh, earlier. I'm just gonna talk about it briefly. It's not super, super relevant to data science, um, but I think it's interesting to see um, some of the arguments that were made because I think they kind of, well, certainly for me, they've made me more confident in in, in the way that I'm working. Um, so the kind of the central argument of the Cathedral and the Bazaar, really, was that um, open source isn't this sort of like nice, woolly kind of, oh, we're all friends and we're all sharing. It's actually better. That was a really, like, key part of it, is saying, actually, if you take your software and open source it, it will be better. 
Um, and there's lots of reasons why that is, and that, that's what the Cathedral of the Bazaar is about. I've taken some of those points um, and thrown them off on this slide. So not expecting you to read the whole slide or understand the whole slide, but they're all there. As I say, we, um, we pop the link in the chat, so do have a look. Um, I'm going to just pick up uh, a few of those just to highlight them and talk about how important they are. Uh, plan to throw one away. I say that as my team will test three times a week. Um, it can feel very depressing sometimes. I've done this loads of times. You write something beautiful and it takes you ages. We rewrite it. It's too difficult. So you just bid the whole thing. And I, I've tried to embrace and I try to get my team to embrace the idea of throwing stuff away. Build it, learn your lessons, chuck it away, you'll make a better one. Um, and um, that's that one. Uh, let's have a look. Release early, release often. Uh, that's obviously a fundamental part of agile development that many of you will be familiar with. Um, I don't think I need to say too much about that, but it's so, so important to get people looking at what you're doing because um, it may seem like you're delivering exactly what they asked for, but very often you find that it's not. Uh, or you are delivering what they ask for, but when you show it to them, they go, oh, what about this? And then you go, oh, yeah, that's what you've met, right? You go back. And then you may throw away the first thing. So they can't, yeah, it all goes together. Um, smart data structures and dumb code works a lot better than the other way around. That is so, 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 so important in data science. So don't forget, this is not this is not data science. This is just software engineering in general. Um, I think that one, yeah, having weird and obviously a lot of us have to live with weird data, but doing something about the weirdness of the data early in the pipeline and writing code against data that you're happy with is so, so, so much easier than having this big ridiculous data mess and just living with it and writing more and more and more weird code to go round and round it. Um, which were the other ones that I was going to, um, going to mention? I think to solve an interesting problem, start by finding a problem that is interesting to you. I think, honestly, quite honestly, that's life advice, isn't it? Never mind about software engineering. That's what you should be doing with your life. Don't do things that are boring and don't do things you don't believe in. Um, and I think the other one that I really like is uh, second one. Sorry, I'm skipping around the slide a bit. The most striking innovative solutions come from realizing your concept of the problem was wrong. So the way I think about that is very often people, when they're doing data science, they do it with a keyboard. They type. Type, type, code, type, 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 type. And that, then like that's, I'm doing data science because I'm typing code. But actually you can type code for like days and then go, you know what, that was all rubbish. So you wrote code that ran, but it's set up wrong or it's, it's just, it, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. What you should have done is got a pen and paper. I sometimes move away from, I will physically remove myself from the keyboard to stop me from doing this and think, use your brain for three hours, figure it out, then write the code. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know much about software engineering. To me, that feels like even more essential in data science than this in software engineering. Anyway, so that's Cathedral in the Bar, as I say. That's some of the, the lessons of it. But essentially, the thesis is software is better, it's more robust, it's more secure. When there are people looking at it, there are people able to change it. Um, and also when you're writing in public. And that's, you know, I think we're getting through this now in the NHS, or it feels like we are. People, when I was talking about this early on, when uh, there was a conversation about it. People were very threatened, like, oh, what if people, what if I make a mistake? People will see it. But you will make mistakes in your life and people will see them. So the, that's that's just going to happen. Better they may find a mistake in your code six months before you ship it than uh, when everyone's running around using your model and you realize that it's wrong. Uh, yes, well, I was just starting to say this actually was nice. So let's have a proper slide. Um, yeah. I firmly believe and others who are more wise and more believable than I am believe that being a good open source coder makes you a good coder, makes you a good data scientist. Writing a meaningful readme, writing meaningful commit messages, writing your code in a modular way. I mean, I always sing the praises of writing shiny in a modular way, but there are, you know, that's just one tiny example of how important it is to be modular when you're writing code. Um, Separating data code from analytical code, separating analytical code from interactive code. Again, that's I'm slightly drawing that from the world of Shiny, but it's fundamental everywhere. Don't write your code in a big spaghetti ball where it's all, don't do that because if you don't like it, you've got to bin the whole thing. Um, assign issues and pull requests, review them. Get someone who knows what they're doing to write the code and get someone else who knows what they're doing to read it. And 
you know, it, so often people don't do that uh, because it's hard and they can't be bothered, uh, me and myself included. Uh, but it's a discipline and it's a discipline that you can't avoid. You know, if you're working in the open, you can't not do code review. You can't not assign issues to the correct person. You've got to work and it forces you to work in that way. Um, so be a good open source developer and be a good data scientist. Um, and the thing that I often remind myself and others is that one of the most useless, lazy and incompetent developers you will ever work with is yourself in six months time. So if I was in a conversation with someone only the other day and they said, I was on one of our repos recently and I was reading the code thinking, oh my God, what a mess. And I looked at the commit history and I realized that I did indeed write that code. So there you go. Uh, write down what you're doing, write meaningful commit messages, have a plan. Maybe you even got a pad of paper that just says something about what the heck you did that could be useful or maybe it's somewhere else. <clears throat> okay, so that's the kind of background. Um, so now, now I'm going to talk about the thing you probably thought this talk was about right from the start and I've been anxiously waiting for, which is uh, software licensing. It's already 25 minutes in. Um, and there are kind of two kinds of software license, really. Um, and I think it's really interesting, to be honest. I, I, I find software licensing, very, I don't know why, but I do find it very interesting. There's loads of different types and they all do slightly different things and you can get really like nerdy and into it. But what I want to say is also, you can also just not do that at all and just pick one of the two main licenses that I'm going to talk about and they do fairly different things. So if you want to nerd out, do. If you just wanted to get on with your job, then just pick one of these two. So the first type, I mentioned it briefly earlier, the MIT license. Um, so, oh, sorry, no, that's not a type, that's an example. The type of license is what's called a permissive license. Uh, MIT is an example of a permissive license. The MIT license is recommended by the NHS X draft guidelines on open source. Um, it's also recommended by me, actually. Uh, not again that I particularly think I have a huge amount of credibility in this space, but it's me talking, so I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the thing about MIT licenses is you don't have to worry about people being put off from running your code. As, as I'll come on to, GPL licenses can make people a bit nervous. So if you're not bothered about, like, you know, keep like, people doing what they want, people just running around and putting it in Excel or just, you know, putting it on the moon. Or if you just want people to just use your code and you don't want to get too fussy about it, just stick an MIT license or put it on GitHub and just forget about it. Um, there are other ones. So Apache is another notable example for the for the licensed nerds. Um, Apache is notable because it has a it has a patent license. Um, so there's this sort of this way of kind of releasing code, but kind of maintaining some intellectual property within that. Um, there's another one from our kind of world, uh, which is the OGL, Open Government License. Um, so civil servants publish everything, I believe pretty much everything they can under the OGL. Um, and the MIT, so they often, civil servants often publish, use MIT for code and OG, OGL for documents, web pages, all that kind of thing. Um, OGL is not particularly recommended for code actually, uh, but you totally can release code on it and people do. So that's why I'm mentioning it. So that's permissive licenses, which is basically do what the heck you want. Copyleft licenses are very different. So copyleft licenses are, um, th there's a bit more to them. Uh, copyleft is like a sort of silly pun type thing. So it's like the opposite of copyright. That's why they've got that funny name. Um, and so basically what GPL says is, it says you can have the code, you can do whatever the heck you like with it. That's totally fine, but you have to release all the code, not just the code that you modified, but your your whole code base under the GPL license. So for example, if you were Microsoft, you famously hate the GPL license, um, and you wanted some nice R package in your in Microsoft Excel, that's you can 100% allow to do that, but then you have to release the source code of Microsoft Excel under the open source license of GPL, which would obviously completely kill the whole thing overnight. So GPL is not suitable for people who want to take code, put it in their code, and then sell it. Basically, it doesn't, it explicitly prohibits that. And there's a whole thing about whether it preserves rights or like, there's this whole thing, because some people say it reduces your rights because it reduces your rights to put it in Excel. Whereas what other people say is it preserves your rights because it preserves your right for other people to see what you did and use it. So there's the kind of the right of you to do what you want, but there's the right of other people to benefit. So what the GPL doing essentially is, is benefiting other people over you. 
So that's like a whole philosophy. Maybe Zoe could do a separate webinar about the philosophy of open source. Um, but it's kind of like a rights based thing. Um, the, inter the thing to note the detail of GPL is that it only applies when you distribute the code. So if you work for Microsoft, if you want to sit in Microsoft and put stuff in Excel and then just mess around with it, you are totally allowed to do that. It, but then you can't do anything with it. You can't distribute it. Now, the, the definition of distribute code is not clear to me. I'm not going to pretend it is. Um, and we've had a real example of this that I won't go into where we were like, what do, well, can we do this? Or could, like, we did have a whole conversation about it. Honestly, I don't know, which is what I was saying earlier about using MIT. People will get nervous. They will go, well, can we do this? And they'll have to think about it, um, which is great. Obviously, GPL is really important and it's done loads of excellent things, but I think it's only just suitable for things where you care about that. If you don't care about that, just stick MIT on it and forget about it. Um, so yeah, in fact, I've written that in a more persuasive form on the slide. So basically, permissive, permissive versus copyleft is, do you want your code to be used or do you want to preserve software freedoms for other people? They are both noble things, but you may have your own view for each of your, all of your code. You may have a different view for different bits of it. Um, and one thing to note as well is that most software licenses are completely unintelligible. So as part of my prep for this talk, I sat down and I was like, I'm going to read the entire GPL license front to back. Uh, and I didn't, I just gave up because I honestly didn't really understand what I was reading. Uh, it's kind of long. I mean, it's not particularly long as software licenses go, the GPL license, um, but it's longish. And there's all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff in there. There's a link to a, a site called TLDR licenses. Uh, so that's at the end of that slide there that you can look at. Um, it just explains licenses. So when I want to know questions about a license, I do not read, I mean, some of them are really long. Um, I do not read the license ever. I go to TLDR and it's got nice little boxes and it explains everything for you. So there you go. And that's where you do need a lawyer. If you want to mess around inside a license, get a lawyer. Um, right, so that's, that's kind of open source in a nutshell. I want to talk about some other things as well that people don't talk about to do with open source, which I think is a shame. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to, to think about them and to bear them in mind in the future. Um, so copyright. Um, so copyright, um, it, it, there is always copyright. It, it, if you make anything at all, it has copyright. It, it, you don't have to go to a special office and fill a form in. It, things are just copyrighted. And the person who, where it is and who's doing it depends on who gets the copyright. So if you sit at home and write, some code just to mess around it's yours usually your employer might have some weird ip clause where it's not yours but in the general case if i went home and wrote the world of warcraft beta it would be mine if you make it at work so if i come off here and write some code of course it will belong to my employer because that's what they're paying um and if someone paid you to make it which is what's known as work for hire so if i don't know i don't i can't think of a good example um what would be, let's say, I don't know, Health Foundation, maybe. So they ring me up now and say, can you do this for us? On the law, you would normally assume that that would be work for hire and therefore they would own the copyright. But I could equally have a conversation with them and say, yes, I'm happy to do that, but I don't really want to give you the copyright. Can I keep it? And they would say no and go, you know, that kind of thing. So, but these are just the automatic, uh, the ultimate, the, the usual way of things. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because um, copyright holders can relicense software. Um, and I don't think that's important most of the time. I haven't, you know, there aren't there aren't lots of examples of big projects in the NHS being ruined because someone's relicensed software. In fact, I don't know if it's ever happened. Um, but nobody ever talks about it, and it could be it could be a problem. So I I would like us to um, to take it more seriously, really. Um, the, the sort of nightmare scenario I've got in my head, and I think it could impede cooperation. I think that's the other thing that bothers me about this. Imagine there's loads of acute trusts, say in the north. And they've all got this thing. They've all got, you're all using the same database or whatever. And they got this problem. They go, well, okay, well, let's all send one of our data scientists over in a day a week. They're just going to sit around, make a load of cool stuff and stick it on the internet and we can all use it. Which is great. Um, but they need to have a serious conversation about who's got the copyright of that, really. Um, because if they don't, they may end up in the future kind of fighting about it. So there may be some reason why they want to, I don't know, like uh, relicense it or take it down, or there might be certain things that they want to do. Uh, and the sort of default that would apply, I imagine, although I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, is that they would all have a bit of the copyright. 
And when they all have a bit of the copyright, that has been witnessed in the world. Everybody has to agree. Um, so there's a there's a great blog post. Do you know, and I've forgotten to link this in the slides last time I did this talk, and I've still forgotten to, do, to link this in the slides. I will try and remember to put it in the NHSR site later, although you might just be able to find it by Googling or maybe Zoe can. The Tidyverse relicensed all their um, all their stuff because they realized it was all a hodgepodge of licenses and they just it was a mess. So they wanted to just relicense it all. But in order to do that, they did have to talk to all the contributors and it was a huge project. It took them absolutely ages and it was very complicated. And they, the story they tell it was very worthwhile and they're glad they did it, but it took absolutely ages. Um, so I just think we need to be more alive to that to that thing because it can it can happen for real and it did uh, with obviously tiny versus close to many of our hearts. So that's, that's kind of a really good example. Um, so the, the short version of this basically is if you're doing something like this, I mean, it doesn't matter who's got, it doesn't really matter who's got the copyright as long as they're not going to do anything stupid with it. It'll just sit there. So if you're in a group or whatever, just give the copyright to somebody that you trust. It doesn't matter who, some organization or whatever. So in the Gold Lake review, it suggests using Crown Copyright uh, for copyright in the NHS. Uh, the problem that Ben says, I'm misquoting it, I'm sure, that the NHS is a shoal, not a big fish. So it's lots of lots of organisations all with their own kind of thing. Much better to give it the, the crown, which is just this big kind of, I don't even really know what it is, this just faceless entity, really, that will just hold it for you. The crown isn't going to do anything annoying with your code. Um, so it's just an organisation that you can trust. Opinion is a little bit divided on exactly uh, how and why and whatever you do that. Personally, I'm in the view of just, if you if you want to do that, just write crown copyright on it. Um, I, I have talk, spoken to various people within government about this and they seem to think that that would probably work. No one's given me a particularly definitive answer. Um, yeah, but I think it's worth a punt. In best case scenario, you have successfully lost your code to crown copyright and you can forget about it. Worst case scenario, someone reads your repo in four years and says, what on earth is this? This is ridiculous. This is how you should have done it. So, but yes, that is not proper advice. That's just something I made up. Um, Right, another story about uh, similar things, um, which is again, probably not, it's not super relevant, but I just think people should have it in their heads because I think all of this stuff can matter. Um, so it's a story of Ice Weasel. So Ice Weasel isn't about copyright, it's a story of, of trademarks. And so basically the way that it went is that there's a particular type of Linux called Debian, um, and they had the permission to use the source code of Firefox under kind of open source licensing, but they didn't have the permission to use the logo Firefox. And basically, I'm going to mischaracterize this. So I'm sorry if anybody who knows more about it watches this on YouTube uh, or is watching now. Um, they didn't like that. They, they took on bridge. I don't think it actually really threw a massive spanner in the works. It was slightly more of a philosophical disagreement, but they didn't like that. So they so they rebranded it to Ice Weasel. So they said, okay, well, we're not we're not very happy about that. We're not very happy about all these things that you've got in your logo. So we're just going to make our own Firefox. We're going to take your source code. We're going to make our own Firefox. And we're going to call it Ice Weasel. And Ice Weasel still exists today. It's existed for quite a long time. I believe the beef has now been settled. And I think Ice Weasel actually will be phased out now because I think they've actually settled the differences now and they're happy to use Firefox again. Um, so, and that does sound like a very obscure and unimportant story, I appreciate. And it is, I think, slightly just the nerd in me that enjoys it. But I do think that it is worth thinking about because you know, sometimes you will be working with a third party who might have their own logos or they might have their own way of doing it. You know, they, they, they might be image, uh, aspects of imaging and trademarks and all these kind of things that you might disagree on. So I think it's just always worth bearing in mind that we're not all just sticking a load of stuff on GitHub and then job done. There's actually quite a lot of things uh, in a project. And one of my projects uh, could, this could be an issue. I'm not going to go into it, um, but uh, I think it could potentially be uh, be important. Um, okay, so that's my like summary of what I think about um, open source from a totally um, kind of naive perspective. I just want to take a couple of minutes just to talk about some of the experiences we've had because they've been very instructive, particularly, I mean, I've had lots of instructive experiences over the years, but we've had some very, very instructive ones recently on a, on a project that I will deliberately not name. Um, but uh, we've been doing it recently, so you can probably go and figure out that in your own time if you like. Um, 
So the first thing we learned is we've learned about the huge benefits of being open. So as I mentioned, Cathedral and the Bazaar uh, talked about this very eloquently, um, but also from a sort of data science point of view as well, we found um, we found it incredibly useful. So, you know, when we're working with people, it's it's really, really helpful when we're getting questions and challenges and, all, you know, like the sort of nitty gritty of actually working with people to just be transparent, you know, because you can get... I think sometimes when, when you're not, when people don't know quite what you're doing, you can get very like, oh, well, how did you do this? And, you know, they get, you get very kind of pedantic, but we don't have that problem. We just go, well, we've done this. And they go, well, what, you know, and you go, there you go, let's go. And I think that does two things. Number one, they can read the code, of course, and check and be happy. But I think the other thing it does, it just changes the relationship because it goes from one of like us going, oh, well, we, we promise you we've done it right. You know, when, who knows, there are people doing all kinds of things on there. So I'm sure a lot of, you know, the, all sorts of idiots and shysters in our in our line of work um, that I won't name. Um, yeah, it changes the relationship into one of like we we're confident in what we're doing. You can have a look. We're not we're not scared. We're not frightened. We're not you know we've been doing it properly. Here it is. If you find a mistake, great, tell us. Um, so yeah, that's been really try. It just makes our job easier in terms of explaining things, but I think it also changes the relationship. So that's another good one. Um, then. There's another story that I'm definitely not going to tell at all. What I'm not going to tell it in the tiniest amount. Um, but essentially what we did, we had a very big project, big, big load of code, all kinds, loads of stuff in it. Most of it was ours. And there was a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit that was not ours. Um, and we kind of thought that was okay. Uh, and in a way that I'm going to be careful not to describe, we discovered that it was not okay. And we discovered that it was really, 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 really not okay. And we discovered that we had to do something about the fact that it was not okay in quite a short time frame, and that was painful, to be quite honest. It was, and I mean, I, I have been saying that for years. Like, look at you, look at your tool chain, look at your code base. You know, check what you're doing. Is it reusable? Is it open? Do you own this? Do you? I've said that many times. Not because I'm, because I've read it basically, because I've read it in books and believed it. But I lived it quite recently, um, and it was painful. So. Yes, I would. If I were you, I would look very carefully what you're doing and think, is there anybody that could tap us on the shoulder and say, I'm not really happy about this. You need to stop doing this. Because if there is, I would rip that out at the root before they come knocking. That would be my uh, that would be my advice. Um, and I think the other thing that we've learned, which is not very exciting, but I think it's just worth mentioning, is that actually it can be sometimes just choosing a different license can be really useful. So. We heavily favor MIT. I favor heavily favor MIT, and so do the team. Um, but there are circumstances which usually relate to stuff that's kind of ours, but isn't really quite ours. You know, I think sometimes it can be nice when you're trying to work with other people to give a license that's maybe a little bit more restrictive because they don't want to, like, in, in my team, we're pretty down with the idea of just giving everything away, to be honest. That's kind of just how we are. Uh, but other people, you know, they work in different ways or they work in different fields or, you know, for whatever reason, there can be lots of good reasons not to work in this way. They don't really want to do that. So I think sometimes just given uh, there's all sorts of uh, creative commons license, there's all kinds of things where you're like, well, yeah, you can reuse it. But actually, there are one or two little things where you kind of just can't just do what the heck you like. Um, so that, I think, could just settle these conversations and make it a bit easier to work with people. Um, this is something. Um, this is again, I'm not almost not so much talking to you, the audience now, I'm talking to what you should say to your bosses and their bosses' bosses. Um, because it surprises me to tell people this early on. Yeah. Software freedom means allowing people to do stuff that you don't want them to do. Because that's what freedom is, isn't it? They, you know, it gets put, it gets, it does get very philosophical. This freedom means freedom, it means being able to do what you want. Um, so, freedom zero, the freedom to use a program for any purpose launch nuclear missiles, run election campaigns for parties, you don't, whatever it is, you can do it. Um, and also the free to improve the program. So they might take a program that you like, you're like, oh, I've written this program and it goes on the hard drive and gets all this data and does all this nice stuff. And then someone takes it and then makes it do something awful that you hate. Tough. I mean, I say, I feel like a lot of people listening to this, you know this already, but I'm just highlighting it to you as something that it's good to get into conversations early on is, I want you to know up front that we're doing this because we believe in it and it's the right thing to do and it will help people that we do want. That's the thing, is it? And the other thing about freedom is that freedom for annoying people that you don't like is also freedom for people that you do like. And sometimes you can't see the people that are doing this stuff that you do like. You can only see the people that are doing stuff that you don't like. 
which is a real bias that we have, we look at what's under our nose. Um, so, yeah. So the code isn't the only thing that has worth in the project. So when you're talking to people about giving code away, they're like, well, what will we do for a living? You know, like, it's all, no, that this, that's not, you all know this, but we don't just write some code and then that's it. The code just goes off and self forms into a robot. And that's not how code works. It's a tool. We're usually building tools and they require humans to operate. And we are those humans. Um, and there are whole businesses founded on basically, here's the Linux source code, which is totally free. And there are people making millions and billions. Uh, you've got obviously people using Python and R and all these things. And they're not selling code because you can't sell R and Python code. That's not a thing. Um, but you can sell knowledge, you can sell know-how, you can sell relationship management, you can sell all kinds of things. And they're better to sell. That's the thing is that I, you know, I personally, I mean, I guess it depends what you're into. I would like to sell myself rather than my code. That feels nicer to me. Like I want to be a human being. I want to sell the human being. I don't, like the software's done. That's finished. We, we wrote that three years ago and shared it. Now we we help with working as people, we're talking and communicating and all this kind of, all the stuff that humans are good at. Um, so, but yeah, as I say, we are, um, we're letting, we're, we're letting it out into the world. Um, and that does let people do stupid things with it, but it doesn't, we're not recommending that people do stupid. And that's, I think the other thing that people can get hung up on sometimes is to go, well, people will think we think this. And you're like, no, people won't think we think anything. They will just think this is the code that we wrote. If we write a decent readme, it will even say like, take this data and do this. You know, it will say how to use it. But if someone wants to not do that and do something stupid, we're not going to, I've often had conversations with people like, we'll get blamed. Like people will do something stupid and people will think it's our fault. And like, they really, obviously, like Excel, I mean, with the greatest respect to Excel, which has done many great things, people have done some horrendously stupid things. People have lost billions of dollars in an hour using Excel. And they're not picking up the phone to Microsoft and saying, how dare you sell me the software because I did used it wrong and lost $3 billion. Microsoft has just said, well, tough luck. That's just how it goes. Um, and that's what we should say too. We should say, yeah, we gave you the code. Did you read the readme? Yeah, well, there you go. That's what that's what it's supposed to do. Um, so yes, this idea of, I mean, I used to just glibly just quote the MIT license to be honest, which says in capital letters, pretty much, if this software burns your house down and you know ends the universe, it's not our fault, pretty much. Um, and that's good. It's good to, it's, I have told people that that's there and they do, but I think it, we need to get, get a bit smarter than that we need to get a bit just saying well you know put your hands up we need to explain uh, kind of why it is and we need to point to things like all, all sorts of software you, you can do stupid things with microsoft word you can do stupid things with the web there's no limit you can do stupid things with a pair of scissors can't you but we still sell scissors to people so i think we need to just stamp that idea out basically we're going to help be responsible for every possible use that any tool could be put to it 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 doesn't you know held up to the light it doesn't make lots of sense um, and the last thing that people say to me um, is, uh, I've, I've realized I'm probably maybe slightly eating to question time, but I'm, I'm quite near the end now. Um, people say, oh, well, what people will sell our code? That's what they'll do. We'll release our code on the internet, and then some people that we don't like will make money out of it, and we can't have that. And what I say to that is, those people are already selling their services. They're not going to disappear just because we don't release this code. So we can either let them sell the same stupid rubbish they were selling before, because if they were selling something good, we maybe would have bought it, but we didn't. We looked at it, as I've done many times, we said, this is awful, made our own. So if we live in a world where they're giving away, where they're selling something that we made that's good, that's better than the universe where they just carry on selling, this, selling the same old rubbish. And yes, I've said that many times. I don't know how far it's sunk into people's brains, uh, but I think it has sunk a little way. In, and I think it's really, we've just got to just stand up and say, yeah, we're, we're making the world better. We're putting stuff out there that makes the world better. And if somebody wants to make money because I made the world better, I, you know, leave them to it. Why not? Um, right, last slide. Um, this is just a, this is just basically a tweet that I saw once that uh, I, I can't find the original tweet, unfortunately, now. But um, it described open source beautifully. It said, it's open source as in piano. Uh, and what they meant by that was, like, sometimes, I don't know if this has ever actually happened to me, but I can imagine it happening. You might see a piano in the street. And it's free because someone's just left it there. So there's a free piano in the street. And you could go, oh, cool, a free piano. But if you want the free piano, you have to get it in your house. You have to clean it. You have to tune it. You have to mend it. You have to do all this annoying stuff with the piano to make it work. And so in practice, it's not free because 
there's all this stuff that you have to do that you don't want to do. So, um, and loads of open source projects, including many of mine, I'm holding my hands up to this, are open source SMP piano. We've done a big complicated, ugly thing, stuck it on the internet, go, there you go, have at it. People look at it and go, well, that would take weeks to use it in my context, so I'm just not going to bother. Um, so I think there's a couple of arguments uh, about that. I mean, I think number one, we just have to accept it. Number two, we have to write better code that doesn't do that, but that's exceptionally hard and costs a lot of money. Um, but one thing I do always say is that I feel like open source code, this is a, another big canard I hear from uh, people who don't work in the business, sometimes manager types. Um, open source code is not, you're not necessarily showing it because you actually think that someone will literally run your actual code. Because often that's just not true. They go, well, we won't have our data or whatever. But you're like, well, yeah, but they'll still be able to see what we did. They'll still be able to look at it and read it and go, oh, look at that. Oh, I haven't seen that before. You'll be able to do something with it. So I almost heard people use the argument, oh, we shouldn't share it because it won't run. Which is honestly, I just think that's so ridiculous. It's like selling someone a car and going, well, it's just going to run out of petrol, isn't it? So what's the point? Yeah, well, yeah, maybe they'll put new petrol in. Maybe they'll kind of buy some parts. Who knows what they'll do? But just let them have it. Yeah, it doesn't, well, it doesn't hurt us, does it? Um, so yeah, I think the, the education part of, of open source can be really, really important. Uh, and also just the transparency of this is what we did. And people can just go, well, that's really that's that's really good, or no, that was stupid, you should have done this, uh, or whatever else there is. Uh, the last thing that I think is relevant to this is I, I hope that I, we, NHSR, whatever, I hope this is, you know, we are we are doing this, is we're building a group of people who can use and contribute to your code. And I actually think, I would argue that that is, yeah, arguably, I mean, you could possibly argue it's actually more important. Building people who can take your big lump of code that you should, probably should have refactored, really, and use it, um, it, it, it would really change things a lot. We've obviously had little pockets, things are getting better, got little pockets of people all over the country now who go, oh, I can do this, and I can do this, and I can do this. And building on that movement and allowing people to reuse this software and, and build on it and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, I do think that is, that is definitely just as much a part of the contribution as uh, writing. Right, that's it. Thank you very much. So opening up to questions, please feel free to type something in the chat if you wanted to. If you do speak up, it will be recorded, but just to let you know, just to remind you. Um, I just want to say thank you for that. That was really interesting. And I have a question. Oh, so somebody says thank you. <laughs> um, You've had some experiences, so it's not been all smooth, let's just say. It didn't put you off putting your code out in the open, but was there a moment there where you thought, oh, oh I shouldn't have done this, this, you know, all those things that other people have said over the years, it's all coming down, or how did you, how did you work through that, or did you, I, I'm assuming you did, you see, that you still feel? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think what I would say to that is, I don't think that once you've been, I think it's the anxiety before you start working in that way, for me anyway, once you're through it, you're in, you're done. Because there's just such a mental block, isn't there? Honestly, I just, I think it's, yeah. So I, I did psych, I started life as a kind of budding psychologist. I think I'm really interested in psychology around this. There's just such a mental block people don't, people, they go, oh, people see what we're doing. You know, like this idea that like, oh my God. And you're like, well, is your work terrible? They're like, well, no, it's quite good actually. And you're like, well, be proud, you know, why would that? I, I mean, and, and I'm not saying I, that I 100% thought that on myself for a long time because it's just so natural. It's on your, it's on your safe, on your, on your computer, isn't it? You're safe, but don't be proud. Like if you're writing terrible code, yeah, don't open source it, but nobody listening to this is doing that. You're all doing amazing things. So just share it and be like, yeah, there it is, yeah. And if it's bad, that's what you say, isn't it? Yeah, it, we prove it. So if you're smarter than I am, which oh, so many people in the world are smarter than I am, just tell me and I'll stick it in. And I just want to sort of say we, we make mistakes, don't we? I mean, my code, yeah. NHSR repository, it's all open. Um, the numbers of commits I've made for things, just I've taken a screenshot of 25 attempts to get a GitHub action to work. And that's okay. Because <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's not even just code, is it? It's just, this is life. I think a lot yeah. of this, too, I don't think the other reason why I wrote this, this is just life. It's about making mistakes in public and just saying, yeah. Yeah, learning. Um, there is a question. What are your thoughts on code which uses lots of different packages, libraries, modules? Is that okay or should people be trying to use base R code or base code, I guess? Be 
parsimonious, ooh, good word, with functions from packages or packages they use for code in the open? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I, I do worry about this, and this is, I'm going to slightly hold my hands up to be ignorant here, because there are loads of G, there's loads of GPL stuff uh, for, in, cram, in, the, in the world of R, in CRAM packages. There are loads of GPL packages. Um, and 99.9% .9 of the time, that does not matter in the tiniest amount, because of course it doesn't, because you're just messing around and making a graph and sending it to your boss. Like, no one's going to stop you doing that. Um, but you do never know where the things are going to go, do you? That's, there's, the old, there's an old cliche that, like, uh, I think it's the next case CD, actually, that, like, if you make a piece of code just really quickly and think, oh, I'm never going to need this again, you can guarantee it'll be in production for 10 years. Whereas if you spend ages making a code really perfect, and then you never use it again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose I wouldn't, I mean, there isn't really a good answer to that question. I don't think anybody, I'm sure someone would answer it better than me, but I think there isn't an answer. The answer is, think about what code you're writing, for what purpose, where it's going to go, and what's in it. And I think that's that's the general thing. As I say, that's the mistake we made with this non-free time bomb in our stuff, is be really aware of what you're using. And uh, also, in my, what's the worst case scenario? You know, could, could in the future you imagine that you are doing something else with this where someone could tap you on the shoulder and say, no, I don't like that. I had I was using a package function that had a stronger license than what we use, something like a GPL or something like that. And I wanted to use one function, so I couldn't use the raw code in the pa package I was creating because that would change the license that I would use, which would be normally MIT. But I checked with NHSR Slack people, and they said if you use the function in its package form, in its just own package, you're using it in a different way, you're not taking the code. So there's this fine line sometimes of like whether you change your own code structure because the license needs to be carried across or whether you just use it like out of the box in a sense. And I can't reproduce what they've done because I didn't know how to do that. So I just used that function as it was, as it stood, but it doesn't change my own package, which is MIT because I'm just using it like I'm using a pen I haven't taken the pen to pieces and made it part of my new fancy pen. And it gets a bit complicated like that. But as you say, what are the consequences of this? I'd have to carry a license that would mean that somebody else would have that license and then that one. And there are, I mean, there are non-free things as well. So yeah. uh, I'm not going to name any because I'll start ranting and then I'll be on YouTube ranting about particular entities but there are things that there are like particularly with the world of visualization there are things that you that are okay to use on your own computer but they're not okay to publish there's all these like weird licenses and so that's a really good example of as i say i think sometimes this all seems all a bit theoretical and who cares but that's a really good example people will spend ages because they don't think i mean why would they they're not used to thinking it this way they draw all these amazing beautiful graphs and then they realize far too late that they actually can't really do anything with them um which is a bit of a shame, isn't it, really? I think there's, I think I'm not blaming the companies, I suppose, for kind of working in that way, but it's a shame that it's just a bit not a bit more obvious that you're sowing the seeds of your own destruction, basically, in those cases. The other thing I'd also say is if you go in with the most open attitude, that kind of makes it easier to work back from because it's, it's kind of extreme in NHSR community, particularly and data science team and the strategy unit are also doing it. As much as they can it's like just just open everything's open all of our words and our thoughts and our methodology and mistakes in an hsr community um and working backwards from that makes it easier because it's just like oh it's all open so when i've spoken to government for example about different licenses and copyrights i'm making it clear it's absolutely open as possible but really what they're doing is trying to think of patents and other stuff which seems really complicated when you just go in with one license and you're like MIT works. <laughs> open. Yeah, I think the other thing is defaulting to open as well helps you get into good habits. Yeah. Because if you're putting stuff on the internet all of the time, it's very natural to think, oh, what, well, oh, just ch start checking stuff. Whereas what you don't want to do is build a beautiful, amazing beast, like, for, and then go, oh, let's put it on the internet. Oh, 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 and then you've got to then, like, meticulously check every little tiny thing. Regularly just pushing stuff. I mean, I actually got into the habit. I don't do it so much money. I'm just writing stuff online. Just whatever, just mo not like the most boring stuff you can imagine. But if I was writing something that I thought anybody might even vaguely take any interest in, I would just stick it on the internet because it's all, well, why not? 
like I can read it there and then it's it's right there. And it has been useful because um, we've got NHSR blogs and I've been going through some of them to move them to the open source website that I'm building in Quarto. And there's some great stuff in there. Some old code because code has changed as well. So some of the functions and some of the packages, they don't work anymore or they don't work as well as the new things because code is changing. So it's, it's quite interesting. But And I suppose words, words get out of date too. We need to update some of our terminology and our knowledge. It's good. But uh, I might take you up on the philosophical discussion because that was quite interesting too. Who owns knowledge? <laughs> I mean, I genuinely think I could do another another one. Well, you you know, psychology and philosophy. Of, uh, yeah. this Because it's all in there, isn't it? I think that would be excellent. But we'll round it off today, I think. So thank you again. No, let's, again. no I want to keep no, everyone. No. Right, no one's leaving. You have to oh, stay. No, I laughing. I thought there was a hand. <laughs> I'm going to close the Zoom prison. The doors of your office are now sealed. I think we might cut that bit out with the Zoom prison. <laughs> so you might not want that one. Okay, so thank you everyone so much, everybody. Um, I'm not the host anymore, so I can't stop the recording. So it just is going to keep rolling on. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, um, I think we are, seriously. I don't know. Anyway. And there's lots of thanks in the chat. I am, yes.